Hey, it's Friday and it's question and answer time. It's Redskin Randy here for you today. And uh, I look forward to answering your questions and I'm so grateful that you take the time to share these questions with us. Janet, if you want to get us started. Okay, hello. Terry asks, I've heard some recent discussion about angels. My understanding is I take my request to God and don't communicate with angels. What is or are there ministering angels? First of all, her... Uh, approach to not taking uh, you know her her prayer request to angels is totally appropriate and we're told in the book of Colossians in the New Testament that we as Christ followers should not try to communicate with angels at all we are to communicate directly with God through Christ however the book of Hebrews she does quote too that it says in Hebrews that uh, angels are ministering spirits given to the heirs of salvation which means that God has assigned angels to watch over we that have returned to him through our trust in Christ. Now, we don't see them. Uh, they're invisible, but we might be surprised at the end of our lives when we get before the judgment seat of Christ to find that many times angels intervened in our lives, maybe even saved our lives at times, and we were not aware of it. But we were we are not ever to seek them. We're not ever to, never to pray to them or to try to communicate with them. Okay. Terry's second question was, how many guineas do you have? Uh, we get this a lot. Uh, last count, 33 guineas. And uh, just a little trivia on them. They're uh, interesting birds. They're actually an African wild bird that's been brought here to this country. They, um, they usually are pretty hard to work with, but my wife has kind of become the guinea whisperer. She raises them from the time that they're nearly hatched, and she literally trains them so they stay on our grounds, and then they return each night to a kennel, a rather large kennel we have for them with a roof on it, so they're safe because they're very vulnerable predators. So um, that, that's our guinea story. We get that question a lot. Okay. And they're super sweet, and they're great about getting bugs and pests. Clear your yard out. Great. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, next question is, can you please explain the three angels, Jobs, Lucifer, Michael, and Gabriel? Uh, Okay, with Gabriel, it's a little, we'll start with Gabriel and Michael because those are a little easier. Uh, they are specifically called in Scripture archangels. Gabriel, of course, was the angel that announced the birth of Jesus. And uh, then we have Michael introduced as the archangel, the guardian angel of Israel. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, he leads the armies of heaven. He will lead them in a final assault against uh, Satan and his angels and force them. This is, has not happened yet in the future. He will force them out of the heavenly realms down to this physical earth. So they are very high-ranking angels. That's about all we know what it means to be an archangel. Now, when it comes to Lucifer, it's even more vague. We have some scant references about him in Ezekiel 28 that seem to indicate that he too may have been an archangel and perhaps the highest of the archangels, but it's it's really getting out on a limb to speculate much about that. Of course, he was the first angel to rebel against God, and then he led a rebellion that swayed one-third of the angelic population. We don't know how big that is, and that could be billions and billions. It likely is that uh, Satan has persuaded to uh, rebel against God and not to trust in him. Okay. Can you please explain the differences between different categories of Christianity, like Baptist, Methodist, etc.? Yeah, uh, a, a lot of these distinctions have just cropped up rather accidentally. For example, let's just take Baptist. Baptists got their name because before the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant Reformation was in the 1500s, but even before that, there were little groups of Christians that insisted no one should ever be baptized until they had put their trust in Christ and become his follower. Whereas the Catholic Church at that time was baptizing infants as they still do today. So they became known for their baptizing practices. And they also, they didn't just sprinkle on the head as did the Catholics in those days. But they took the biblical word baptism, which is a Greek transliteration. The Greek word is baptizo. It was used of cloth dyers who would take cloth and immerse it completely under the dye so that the dye would intermingle with it and become a part of it. Well, they took that word as baptism, as and baptism they practiced by complete immersion, whereas the Catholics were only just sprinkling people, so they became known as Baptists. Now, when you come to Methodists, uh, here's another thing, just an oddity. There was this wonderful, great Christian man named John Wesley in England, 
And the churches in England at that time, of Wesley's life, they, they were dead. They were just preaching religion, but there was no vital relationship with Christ presented. So Wesley started going out into the streets of England, and as people would be you know, going in large numbers to work, to work in the factories and various things, he would meet with them and he would preach Christ to them. Well, he started reaching so many people for Christ, he didn't want to send them back to the dead churches, so he started gathering them in little small groups and he taught them certain questions to ask one another to help them to continue to grow. These questions became called the methods. The, the groups had these methods. They would say, you know, what sins have you struggled with? Have you read your Bible this week? All these kinds of things. Well, they grew and they grew and they grew until finally Wesley was forced to start a movement called the Methodists. They became the Methodists because they practiced John Wesley's methods. Uh, other groups like the Episcopalians, for example, they take their identity from one uh, description of Christian leaders in the New Testament, uh, the bishops, it's translated in the King James, but it's the Greek word episkopos. And, and the words for Christ, the leader of a, of a New Testament church, they're, they're really indistinguishable. Sometimes that leader, calling the senior leader, the senior pastor, he's called the poimain or the shepherd or pastor. Sometimes he's the episkopos, which means he's the overseer. Uh, at other times, he's called the um, presbyteros, which means the elder, but they're used interchangeably. Anyway, the Episcopalians, they emphasize the overseer role and they start a whole denomination out of that. So, so these are unfortunate distinctions that have divided Christians over peripheral issues. Having said that, God in his great grace, he still works with us in all of our uh, little segments of Christianity. Okay. We have two similar questions. We're going to put them together. Why are the Jewish only focused on the Old Testament if they are the chosen people? Why do the Jewish not believe why do um, why do the Jewish not believe that the Messiah has come? If they are God's chosen people, how is it that they believe what they believe? Thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, you you answer the first question about why they only accept the Old Testament by the second question. The second question states, um, part of it is that they don't accept that Jesus was the Messiah. Let, let's first of all discuss what does it mean to be chosen. This is a great, um, uh, it's a term that's brought great confusion today. When you go back into what the Bible says about it, Moses is sent by God to bring the people of Israel uh, out of slavery in Egypt. They had been there for nearly 400 years. So Moses goes, brings them out, and God says that he wants them to form into a nation. And they become his chosen people. Now here's the big question. Chosen for what? Does that mean that they're automatically uh, saved and certain of eternal life in God's everlasting kingdom? No, no. They were chosen to be a people that God would start to reveal himself to and their job was to pin down. They were the start of the writing of Scripture. They were to receive this revelation that God was going to give of himself, this expanding, progressive revelation. They were to write it down. They were to preserve it. They were to pass it on. So they were chosen to be recipients of God's revelation, to preserve it and pass it on to the rest of the world. That was what it meant to be chosen. God entered into a special covenant. We call it the Old Testament or Old Covenant. He said, if you're going to be my people, your conduct has to illustrate my principles, my ways of life. So, if you accurately illustrate my principles and my ways of life to the rest of the world, I'll bless you. Your crops will grow, your cattle will be healthy, you'll be healthy. But if you start misrepresenting me to the people, I can't possibly bless you and support a wrong revelation of myself to the rest of the world. So, there were also curses in the covenant. So they were chosen for a distinct role. It did not mean that individual Israelites were chosen to immortality and eternal life. That was never the case. So for 1,500 years leading up to Jesus, there were little portions of the Old Testament that gave these little snapshots, little portraitures of this coming one, the Christ, the Messiah. He was going to be the one that revealed God totally. He was going to be the one that set things right. He was going to be the one that broke uh, mankind free from the power of sin and so on. So then, when Jesus comes, the religious leaders of his day were so angry at being oppressed by the Romans and having so much historical oppression, whether it was the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Persians or the Greeks and then the Romans, 
that they had created an image of the Messiah that he was going to be this military political deliverer who was going to overthrow the Roman government and make Israel the chief of the nations. But that's not what the Messiah was about. The Messiah was to save mankind from our slavery to sin. It was to change our hearts and minds in the way that we thought about God, to turn us from distrusting God to trusting Him, from fearing God to revering Him, and from loving sin and being seduced by sin, thinking that it was something good for us, to awakening us to see that it was killing us. That's what the Messiah's role was. So the religious leaders were so jealous of Jesus, they led the people against Him and they rejected Him as their Messiah. Now, not all, because many Jews did trust him as the Christ, the Messiah, and became the early followers of Jesus, as his disciples were, and then thousands thereafter, after he rose from the dead. But today, what you have are, for the most part, those that identify themselves as Jews. They think that the Messiah, the Christ, is still yet to come. Now, it's a fascinating thing. Right now, uh, the rabbis over in Israel, they believe that the the Messiah, the Christ, is soon going to appear on the scene. Now, the reason this is phenomenal is because Israel didn't even exist as a nation. From 70 A.D., Titus, a Roman general, destroyed the temple, destroyed the nation of Israel. They ceased to exist as a nation. No such nation as Israel. And yet the Bible, the Old Testament, kept predicting they would be destroyed as a national entity, but then, like a bunch of dry bones, Ezekiel 36 talks about it, they would be rebirthed as a nation and come back to their land in the last days, prior to the culmination of the times. Well, in 1948, after being not a nation from 70 AD to 1948, they were reborn as a nation. In 1967, they regained Jerusalem as their capital. And so now, the rabbis in Israel, many of them believe that at any time the Messiah could come. They're expecting the Messiah, the Christ, for the first time. We Christ followers, we Christians, we know the prophecies of the Bible. We're expecting Jesus to return too very soon. So we're looking for the, the second coming of Christ. They're looking for the first coming of Christ. So it's a fascinating time in human history. Okay. B's question is Matthew 28, the resurrection. Early on Sunday morning, as a new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Who was the other Mary? Uh, the other Mary is the Mary we read about. There was Martha and Mary, and remember when Jesus came to their house, it's Lazarus' sister. Uh, Martha was so bothered about, you know, getting everything, you know, arranged and cleaned, and she gets angry at her sister Mary because Mary was just sitting Mary was just sitting at Jesus' feet. And Jesus says to Martha, he said, you know, your sister, she's chosen the good part. So anyway, that, that's the Mary. Mary also was the one that anointed Jesus just prior to his arrest and ultimate crucifixion. And Jesus said, she's anointing me for my burial. Mary had an insight, like John did, that the others didn't seem to have. Anyway, that's who that Mary was. Okay. Um, B also has another question. I have read almost every version, and I can't grasp the meaning of this, especially where is it in the book of Luke? Luke 23, 29 to 35, the message, Skull Hill. Okay, well, let's start, first of all, with, with the message. The message is not a translation of the Bible. It is a paraphrase, and it's the loosest paraphrase that there is. So that's, that's number one. And so uh, the term skull hill, the message used, in other true translations, it will say things like, and they brought Jesus to, to the place called the skull or Golgotha or various things like that. So it was just a, kind of a known place, this particular hill where they crucified Jesus. It was kind of in slang term called the place of the skull or the hill of the skull. And so that's all it means. Now, the way the question was written, uh, I want to be, be honest and say, I'm not sure I'm answering this question correctly. So B, if you hear this and I'm not answering the right question, please try to uh, write it again and, and I'll try to figure out more uh, to the point what, what, what you're saying. Okay. Um, our next question is, why does it feel that faith, trust, can change based on the day? Should it be a constant faith? Uh, it should, but... 
we are ever in a developmental journey, and so typically it's not. Okay, so here's why it should. God has completely revealed his trustworthiness to us in Christ. Christ's life, his teachings, his miracles, and most of all, his sacrificial death and his resurrection. God has proven himself trustworthy. If he's good and powerful enough to create the universe and loving and sacrificially devoted to us enough that even when we were sinners to die a sacrificial death to draw us back in trust to himself, well then there is nothing that uh, that we should ever consider worthy to, to break our trust in him. In other words, he has removed all the barriers to our trust in the way that he's revealed himself as trustworthy. Now having said that, we're human beings and our trust in Christ, our trust in God grows the longer that we follow him, the more that we obey him, the more that we learn his word, internalize it, obey it, our experience with God grows, and as our experience with God grows, our faith, our trust in him also grows. And because we're still in process of putting off our old self, which is still with us, and putting on the new self, according to Ephesians 4, verse 20 through 24, well, at times that old self can become quite faithless on any given down point in our life. We, we can just be overwhelmed at times and say or do things that make it look like we don't trust Christ at all. But if our trust in Christ was real, we will ultimately always come back to a place of trust in Him. Okay. Our next question is, will we, will we be judged for our sin as Christians? No, the Scripture says that uh, Christ has uh, completely forgiven us and we will not be judged for our sins, but we will be judged. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, as well as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it couldn't be more clear that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14 says this too. And we'll be judged by what it says is the deeds while in the body. And what it's saying is this, is that once we've put our trust in Christ and become his followers, God has given to each of us a certain amount of time, a certain amount of treasure or money, and a certain amount of talents or abilities, opportunities to serve, and we can either be good and faithful servants or wasteful, lazy servants, as in the parable in Matthew chapter 25. So we will be judged as to how faithful or unfaithful we have been in serving God, in managing the resources He has given us for His divine kingdom interests and so forth. But sin is has been put away. When Christ sacrificed Himself on the cross, He was announcing to human beings the complete forgiveness of sins. Now, it is, it is critical to understand this. If whoever asked this question, if in your mind you are struggling with the thought, oh, well, if that's the case, it really doesn't matter how much I sin because God's going to forgive me anyway. You are not understanding God. You, you, you may not be in the place of true trust that God wants us to be in. You see, when I come to trust in Christ, I trust him that he tells me that I have been the slave of sin, it says in John 8, but that who puts their trust in him, the son, is made free from sin. God wants to free me from sin. Why? Because sin is not my friend. Sin is destroying me. It's destroying the world. It destroys relationships. It destroys everything it touches. So if we are pondering in our minds that, oh, since we're all, we're completely forgiven our sins, it's kind of a license to sin well, then you, you need to get closer to God or talk to somebody because you're misunderstanding the purpose of Christ's sacrificial death. It was to break the power of sin in our lives. Okay. Our last question is, I'm confused. If at the end of the tribulation, the believers who are left on earth and the believers who have already died all receive our resurrection bodies and the unbelievers go to Hades and then starts the millennial reign in which we believers with resurrected bodies rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Then who is left for us to rule over? Who is left that will be populating the earth with new births? Uh, the misunderstanding there is that the unbelievers uh, will all be sent to Hades uh, at the start of the millennium. That That is not taught in Scripture. In fact, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about that there will be a judgment of all the nations that are left. You have to understand, when the tribulation starts, that seven-year period of human history, the last seven years leading up to the return of Christ, the world's population uh, is going to be large. For example, right now it's seven and a half uh, billion people. 
So when you read the book of Revelation and the occurrences that happened very swiftly, particularly in the last three and a half years of that seven years, the Earth's population is going to be approximately cut in half in a very short period of time. So we're going to go from about seven and a half million to about three, excuse me, seven and a half billion to about three billion. So when Jesus returns and we that are uh, his followers are given our resurrection bodies, the questioner was correct on that, and we are now in an immortal state, there will still be probably a couple billion at least human beings still alive on earth, even though they were not believers in Christ, they will still be allowed to enter into that millennial time. Now, Jesus does talk about some of them in Matthew 25, that when the Christians were being persecuted and imprisoned and starving, they reached out to them, they helped them. And Jesus says, inasmuch as you've done it to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you've done it unto me. And so they're, they're given a pass. So we don't know what the numbers are going to be like because there are other scriptures that clearly teach. For example, in Matthew 16, I believe it's verse 27, that when Jesus returns, it says his angels are going to gather out of his kingdom all that causes stumbling. And he talks about the wheat and the tares, that the angels are going to take the, the tares or those that are not followers of Christ off the earth out of the kingdom. So the point is this. There will still be lots of people on earth for the resurrected followers of God to rule and reign over for that thousand years. And those people that are still alive, they live through the tribulation, they will have an opportunity to repent and now to truly put their trust in Christ because Christ will be ruling and reigning, will be ruling and reigning with him. They will see for themselves the goodness of God and the beautiful society that that goodness creates and they'll have an opportunity to put their trust in him. So that, that's where your confusion on that comes. Okay, um, that is all. Want to close us in prayer? I will. Uh, Father, we thank you again that uh, we have your word as such a source of truth. And we wouldn't know who we are. We wouldn't know why we're here. We wouldn't know the meaning of life. We certainly wouldn't have an inkling about the future if you had not, in your kindness, given to us your word, uh, preserved it, protected it, and passed it on to us. Help us to treasure it stir our hearts to study it, and particularly in this time when we have more time to seek your face through your word in a way that we have never done so before. I ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. FCF, thank you for your questions. I uh, got, a, got a message coming up this Sunday. Uh, it's a second, uh, second uh, message about sheltering in place. Don't miss it. And listen, if you liked anything you heard on here and you think it's interesting, that it might be interesting to somebody else or any of the messages we've done recently, Please pass this on to friends, family members, or whoever you think might be interested in it. Goodbye for now.